All right, how's it going, y'all? So today, we're going to be going over how do you set up a Synology NAS as a repository for your virtual machine data sets. So this essentially allows you to store all of your virtual machine data on Synologies, and this has tons of benefits. First off, virtualization platforms do not have the best storage solutions. A lot of them do not have any kind of integrated setup, and honestly, I think they all just expect you to use something else for storage like this because a lot of them don't even have easy ways of viewing the status of the drives. So that's option one is just convenient. And option two is the ability to have multiple virtual machines, multiple actual hosts that are actual servers. So you could have 12 servers all sharing the exact same data set. And this has huge, huge, huge benefits from one, just not having to deal with 12 servers with a storage and also allowing virtual machines to now simply migrate between different hosts. So for me, I can migrate between a cluster where without the virtual machine even shutting down, I can start it on one host and move it to another host because the only thing that's actually unique to the host that it's running on is the RAM and the CPU. And those are not that hard to migrate on over and you lose maybe two packets when pinging it. And while you're doing this, the virtual machine is just frozen for about two seconds as it syncs the RAM between the two machines and starts it up. It's really impressive and it works because the massive data that it has, which is the drive, is not stored on any one of those hosts, but it's rather stored on an external device. And finally, the third reason to do this is high availability. You can have two Synologies in HA where they are using your storage provider. Then if one of them fails, it can automatically fail over to the other one. So it's really useful there as well. So if you're building out a highly redundant system, having your storage be high availability where it auto fails over is really valuable. And all of that is not to mention the snapshots, the backups, the replication, everything that makes, makes it just really easy to set up storage and also set up very efficient storage on Synology NASes. And so regardless of what storage you're using, so this could be true NAS Synology, this could be anything, and what virtualization software you're using, be it XCPNG and Zen Orchestra that you're using here, VMware, really whatever, there are really two fundamental options whenever you're setting this up. And they are a battle as old as time iSCSI or NFS. Both iSCSI and NFS have very, very, very good low latency performance over a network. And this is critical for virtual machines because disk IOPS, how quickly operations can be done on a drive, not necessarily how much throughput, but really how quickly operations can be done are the number one thing about when a VM feels slow or not, especially when we're talking about databases. And in this video, we're going to be going over what I primarily use, which is NFS. I'm planning on going into it much more in depth in another video, so subscribe to check that out. But NFS has what's called file-based storage. So it's a lot closer to SMB than iSCSI, which is what's called block storage. iSCSI presents essentially a hard drive, and that's it to the virtual machine. And the virtual machine host handles all of that. So it actually builds a file system on top of it. Whereas with NFS, it presents files. And the reason NFS and file systems are so nice is when it comes to doing things like backups, replications, and restores, when you're using iSCSI, the actual host, the Synology, has no clue what are in that disk. It is a black box that only the actual virtualization host understands. But with NFS, you'll see here, we can actually just see all the virtual machine disks and restore them from snapshots if required. It makes it much easier for that. And because it's also actual files and not block-based storage, upgrading storage and also decreasing storage and reallocating resources is trivial. With iSCSI, you basically build a hard drive and it's a fixed amount of space and give it to the host. You can't shrink it because the storage provider, in this case the NAS, has no clue what data is where. So iSCSI makes it very hard to shrink volumes. With NFS, if you delete a VM, that storage is just gone. But with iSCSI, that's not true. And so that's why we're going with NFS for this, and that's primarily why I use it. But neither one of them are bad options. Everybody's got their own opinions, and they both work great. 
I think NFS is just a little easier to set up and easier to maintain. But one thing iSCSI does have that NFS does not is easy authentication. And we'll talk about that later on in this video. All right, so that is the overview of what we're doing. Now let's talk about how we're actually gonna do it. And we need to have a VLAN or a protected network for this. So NFS does not really support its own authentication. Really, you use what's called IP-based authentication. So you say, hey, this, this, this IP address are allowed to access these disks, which from a security perspective is not the best unless it's on an isolated VLAN that's fully trusted. And so that's what makes this really important. Technically, you can use Kerberos authentication, but I've not seen anybody actually set up and deploy Kerberos authentication for NFS, except for massive corporations. So really, for the most part, you're using IP-based authentication, which means you need to segment your network. And this is where VLANs are really, really, really useful. So segmenting your network essentially means creating a storage-only VLAN. And this storage-only VLAN is only accessible by devices that are actually on the VLAN. So this adds a ton of protection for you because now compromised systems like virtual machines, they're not on that VLAN, so they can't even try to use NFS. And so that's one really important thing. And that's why we're going to be using a dedicated NIC. So one of the dedicated network ports just for NFS traffic. In this case, it's going to be LAN 5. So what I've already done is I've got a cable right here. And I've already gone through on my Unify switch and I have passed through my storage network to this cable. I also have a tutorial about VLANs coming out, but basically there is a VLAN at the end of this where it is only on the storage network. So only this cable can access the storage network, that and the actual storage ports on my machine. Now you've got to do the exact same thing, both on the Synology as well as on the virtual machine hosts. So every single one of my three virtual machine servers that I've got, each also have one of their network ports dedicated to storage. This is not only important for security, but it has the added benefit of making sure that VM network traffic can never bottleneck your storage backend. So as you can see right here, I've got LAN 1 plugged in and it's on my regular network. And that's actually how we're connecting to it now. But what we're gonna do is we're going to set up my LAN 5 right here to be on my storage network. If you're using tagged VLANs, you could instead use this enable VLAN, but I generally recommend for security, not using tagged VLANs at the host level, but rather using tagged VLANs actually at the switch level. And so that's why whenever I'm allowing that storage VLAN to a host, I'm always doing it at the switch level. So that way a compromised device can't say, oh, hey, I'm gonna switch VLANs to this VLAN. All right, so with all that out of the way, what I'm gonna do is assign an IP address on that storage VLAN. And because it does not have any routing, I only need to enter the IP address and the subnet mask. And this is not accessible by anything except for that NFS traffic. So now I'm gonna go ahead and plug it in. And so it's plugged in, it's gone green. And then what I did is from another one of my servers, I'm pinging this IP address because this laptop, I can't ping it because it's not on that VLAN. And so I know it's connected. Okay, so that is now step one out of the way. We are on that network. And I did the exact same thing, and actually already have it set up, on my Zen Orchestra. So all my hosts have IP addresses. The next thing we need to go ahead and do is set up our shared folder. So you're going to want to use a dedicated shared folder for this. Hit create, create shared folder, no recycling bin. It's probably a good idea to hide it from the my network places. And we'll call it VM storage. I would recommend not having any spaces on this as you're going to be mounting this and it's a lot easier if you don't have any spaces depending on what you're using. Encryption up to you. Then depending on how critical performance is, you can either toggle enable data checksum on or off. If you're looking for the utmost performance, not checking the checksums does increase your IOPS. So if you're running a database where it's really critical that you hit your IOP requirements here and you've got good solid backups in other ways and you're not as worried about bit rot, this is useful. But if performance is not as critical, 
it's a good idea to check as it really can help reduce the risk of corruption, especially over the course of 10, 20 years. And one thing I would really not do unless it's very little performance is enable compression. Though in general, virtualization compression is way more efficient than regular file system compression because virtual machines just by their own nature have a ton of compressible data in there, whereas other file systems might not. Then we're not gonna manage any permissions here, but what we are going to do is come into file services, NFS, and enable NFS, and we can go up to NFS 4.1. Now, if you wanted to, you can also try to optimize your packet sizes. In general though, AKB makes the most amount of sense for that. Now what we can do is we're going to go ahead and enable NFS on that NIC and on this right here. So what we're gonna do is come into this NFS permissions tab and start managing some permissions. So what you type right here are the IP addresses of the host you wanna be able to access it. So if it's just one, you do that. And it also supports subnet masks. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say anything on the 10.31.1 slash 24 subnet, really that network range because it's not actually a dedicated network, it's a slash 16, no worries there. But basically anything that starts with these three octets will be allowed in. It's really up to you however you wanna do it. The most secure thing is to write one of these profiles for every single one of your virtual machine hosts. And that way you have to manually add it in there and no weirdness happens, but you can also do it with DNS rules as well. Then if you do not set up UIDs for everything, for your squash, mapping all users to admin. So what this essentially says is everybody on the subnet who shows up with NFS has full access to the share. And with our configuration, that's what we want. If you've got a entire UID system and you've got other users on there who you wanna make sure don't have this access, you can limit this down however you want to. But if this is a dedicated VLAN for just storage, map all users to admin is the easiest. And then allow users to access mounted subfolders is important because the way this works is every single one of the VMs gets its own subfolder that's independently mapped. So these are our basic settings here. And now we can just hit save. Now, one important thing that we've got to see here is this mount path. So NFS has an absolute path for mounting. So now we're going to need to copy and paste this guy. All right, so now our Synology is pretty much fully set up and ready to go for it. If you want to be even more locked down, you can actually use firewall rules to block NFS traffic from anything else. But given the routing, the only place these IP addresses could possibly come from would be that dedicated VLAN. So the next thing we're gonna do is go ahead and configure our host to actually hook up to this traffic. And so I'm gonna be using Zen Orchestra and XCPNG, but once again, there's a version of this for pretty much every host. So I'm just gonna come down to new storage, and I'm gonna put it on my R630 pool, which has two VMs on it. And we're going to choose NFS. So now, we're going to go ahead and choose what NFS version we'd like. And we're gonna go ahead and type in that IP address on the storage VLAN for this. And now we should be hit find. Perfect, and so if it finds it, it detects that there is an NFS server running and it even finds the path. That's awesome, that's actually a new feature. Um, so right here, that's what we've filled out. Most of the time you have to manually type this in and there, this is where if we wanted to, we could actually make a subdirectory with a subfolder, but instead we're going to expose the entire thing. And now just like that, we have shared storage on there. I can come in and I can create a new VM on that storage. So all I had to do was just choose that disk. If we come back into the Synology, we can see that data set has been built. Now, this is gonna be incredibly slow because we only have a single hard drive in there, but it should be fast enough to at least boot and run and all those good things, but I think that is why this crate is taking quite a while. And now we can see our network traffic going on in. And remember, we can also set up snapshots on this, which is awesome. So I can come in here and I can go ahead and set up a snapshot protection plan 
which will actually give us the ability to have even Zen Orchestra critically screw something up and be able to restore it. Now, you still need to back up your metadata, so like the settings and things like that, but this is a way to have an independent setup where Zen Orchestra can mess something up and you can actually roll back all of your hard drives if you need to. And because we're using NFS, you can also just choose to roll back one specific drive because as you can see, they're all just folders. Finally, we can also use standard snapshot replication to send it to a second host as a failover target. There's so much stuff we can do with this. But as we can see right here, it is sending over about 50 megabytes per second, even though we've got that 10 gig network, mostly due to the fact that, well, we only have a single hard drive in this thing that's probably working at maximum capacity. So once it's done sending over there, it'll just automatically boot. And because this is shared storage, I'm gonna be able to move this VM from one host on the R630s to a second host on the R630s, all while losing maybe two seconds of data without ever shutting down the VM. And we'll show this after this thing finishes building. Okay, so now the VM has booted and we can see it's got an IP address. And I forgot, I actually have a SSD cache in this thing that actually helped quite a bit with our IOPS because virtualization is one of those things that having a read cache and especially a read write cache helps a ton with. But what we're gonna go ahead and do is we can actually go ahead and see this IP address here and we can just ping it. So we can see it's connected right there. And now what I'm gonna do is actually migrate it from VM03 to VM01, which are both on the same cluster using Zen Orchestra. And what'll happen is we are going to have negligible downtime, which is one of the things you just could not do without shared storage like this. So I can just hit this migrate button and just move it on over to VM01. and hit okay now we're going to watch this and we should miss almost no packets as it actually comes through due to the fact that the vm does not really have to shut down all right so this is it right here so we lost what five packets that was all it took to migrate from one host to another maybe 35 seconds and we lost five packets of a ping. And we moved physically from one server with its own independent CPU and RAM to another because the really big stuff, the hard stuff to move, the storage, did not have to move. And that is why having shared storage is so great with things like that. All right, well, that's gonna be it for this tutorial. We now can just build our virtual machines on there and it's all stored in one centralized location and you can do things like cross-site replication to have backups to other sites and be able to boot these up very easily. By the way, I do this professionally, so if you want to hire me, there's a link for that down in the description below. And if you have any other questions, put those down in the comments below. And have a good one. Bye.